The ongoing mission of Bethany Baptist Church, SBC, is to provide an accurate picture of the one true and living God to our members and to the community. We will accomplish this continually through worship, fellowship, 
discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. Here at Bethany, we love God. We acknowledge the kingdom of God. The kingdom is revealed to man through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Join us in worship, prayer, and his living word. Amen, amen, and amen. Good morning to everybody, and we pray that you are joining with us on this Father's Day. Now, as we bless our fathers, we pray that you will join us right now in blessing our Heavenly Father. He is a good, good Father, and we're going to give Him glory. So join with us as we worship Him in spirit and in truth. God bless you.
You are a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. And lest we forget or lest we become despondent, lest we become discouraged, lest we want to give up, let me remind all of you this morning that God is still in charge. He's still on the throne. He sits high and he looks low and we just want to thank him this morning. What a mighty God we serve. It's prayer time. And while you're thanking and while you're praying, uh, we want to remember the families uh, in this country. We've lost over 120,000 people to COVID-19. We want to remember those families, those families that are grieving and those families that have lost loved ones. Also, we want to remember the families that are suffering with loved ones uh, in the old folks' homes or in the hospitals that uh, may be suffering from this disease. I want to remind you that God is still in charge. Amen. And he's still looking out for us. We want to remember those that have lost loved ones here at Bethany and those that are in the old folks' home and those that are in the hospitals and those that are sick among us. In our time of prayer, uh, let us not be selfish and let us remember those that are less fortunate than we are. Let us remember those that are homeless and those that are without employment this morning and those that are living from paycheck to paycheck. Amen. But guess what? God got us up this morning and he started us on our way gave us a reasonable portion of health and strength. And I don't know about you all, but I am grateful. Amen. For our scripture reading this morning, we have chosen the 23rd number of Psalms. And it reads for your listening. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Listen to this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearers of his word. And while we are praying this morning, let us remember Lisa, Sister Reese's daughter. Let us keep her fervently in our prayers. Amen. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, it's again we come. Lord God, uh, we come uh, with thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord God, we come thanking you for all that you've done, you are doing, and you will do. Lord God, we come this morning recognizing that you're God, and Lord God, you're God all by yourself, and we want to say thank you. Lord God, we thank you for allowing us to take our rest last night and Lord God we thank you for dispatching your angel that watched over us all night long Lord God you kept seen and unseen danger away from us and Lord God we want to say thank you Lord God uh, and early this morning Lord God early this morning before the rooster crowed Lord God early this morning about before the sun came up you touched us and Lord God our eyes flew open and we witnessed a day that we've never seen before and for that Lord God we just want to say Thank you. Lord God, you allowed us to get out of our beds. And Lord God, you allowed us to realize that we had a portion of our health and strength. And we want to say thank you. Lord God, we were clothed in our right mind. And we want to say thank you. We were able to feed ourselves and able to bathe ourselves. And we just want to say thank you. Lord God, that as you as you allowed us to move from room to room, we we found out, Lord God, we recognized that our loved ones were still in the land of the living. And Lord God, for that, we, we are grateful this morning. And Lord God, the only thing that we can say, the only thing that rolls off our lips is, thank you. Lord God, I declare right now with all the fiber within me that you are a great God. And besides you, 
Lord God, there is none other. Lord God, we pray for those families that have lost loved ones. Lord God, those families that are suffering from the COVID-19 disease. Lord God, we ask and we pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, bless those families and we pray, Lord God, that you will bless the doctors and bless the scientists. And we pray, Lord God, for a cure right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we pray for the politicians that, Lord God, on so many occasions, Lord God, uh, they get it wrong, but we pray right now in the name of Jesus. Have mercy, Lord God. We pray for the senators and we pray for those that are in the House of Representatives. We pray right now, Lord God, that you would just have mercy. We pray for the protesters in the street. Lord God, we pray right now that you will bring this nation together. Have your way, Lord God. Have your way right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, thank you for all the things that you have done, all the things that you are doing, and all the things that you will do right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for that single mother that, that's raising kids, and Lord God, she's living from paycheck to paycheck. Lord God, let her know right now that you are still in control. Lord God, and you got her back right now in the name of Jesus. Pray for that single father. And we pray for those that are unemployed this morning. Pray, Lord God, that you will be a provider. Pray that you will be a bridge over troubled water. God, Lord God, we pray that you'll be bread in a starving land. Have mercy right now in the name of Jesus. Pray, Lord God, that you will open up doors. And Lord God, for your word declares that if you open up a door, Lord God, uh, can no one close it. We pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would just have mercy. We bless your name. We bless your name. We, we bless your name right now. Lord God, for you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy of all of our praises. And we just want to say thank you. Lord God, we pray for our pastor. Pray that you will crown his head with wisdom and knowledge. We pray, Lord God, that you allow him to preach the uncompromising gospel. Pray for his family and his family tree. We pray for our assistant pastor, Reverend Hunter. Lord God, bless him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Pray for his family and his family tree. Lord God, bless right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for Bethany as a whole. Pray for our leadership. Lord God, we pray for everyone that, Lord God, that has a small part or has a big part or has any part at all. Lord God, in keeping your services going, we ask and we pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we pray that you will bless your word, bless your word, bless your word. For we know that if your word is preached, if your word is preached, Lord God, backsliders will be redeemed. If your word is preached, have mercy right now. Lord God, again, we just want to say thank you. Lord God, thank you. Lord God, and you know, if you don't do anything else, we know. Lord God, if you don't do anything else, we know you've already done enough. Lord God, again, we just want to say thank you. Lord God, it's these and all that we ask in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank God. Stay up to date with ministry efforts, fellowship, and worship opportunities available at Bethany Baptist Church, SBC, where we have been committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ for over 90 years. Here are your morning announcements. Having a hard time staying connected while social distancing? On your smart device, access YouTube. In the search bar, type Bethany Baptist Church SBC New. That's Bethany Baptist Church SBC N E W. Click the subscribe button. That's it. Now you'll never miss another opportunity to worship, receive ministry details, or get your weekly Sunday school lesson. You'll even receive notifications when new posts are available. Stay ahead of the class with Sunday School. New lessons posted every Monday on our YouTube channel. Subscribe now.
Every Sunday, we will partake in the Lord's Supper. Members can pick up their communion packets curbside every Saturday between 11 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. Tithes and offerings can also be turned into the waiting deacons at this time if you have not chosen any of our other three ways to give. Well, family, this is awesome. Happy Father's Day to each and every one of our fathers out there. Thank you so much for everything that you've lovingly invested in your children and those that maybe even weren't your children. If you're like me, you got up this morning and your kids were jumping all over you and you were excited, you know, as they continue to show their love to you. You know, it's something to say about those that invest in your life. And I pray that each and every one of you out there are learning through the Spirit of God how to invest in something bigger than yourself. And so, as we always do, especially around this exciting time of service, we pray that you will join us in this time of giving. There are a few ways that we can give. Uh, for those of you who perhaps are still giving by mail, you can always send your tithe, your offering in to Bethany. You can uh, write it out, 7304 Homestead Road. It's Houston, Texas, 77028. And you can give in that manner. You can also give by auto draft. Perhaps by some chance you want to link your account to Bethany. You always want to have it ready to give. That's great. Do that, and we'll gladly receive that offering, that tithe at your hand. And, of course, we have our mobile app. You can always get the uh, cash app and put in the dollar sign, Bethany1925, and you can give in that way. By this, you're able to do God's kingdom work through this local church, Bethany, and we'll continue to show our love to those so desperately in need, especially at times like this. So we pray that you'll bow with us, and let's ask the Lord's favor over everything that's given and those that have a desire to give, because we know that if you have the desire in your heart that the Spirit of God is put there, then believe you me, God is able to fulfill that desire. Lord God, we pause and say thank you, Lord, for everything that you continue to allow us to have at your hand. We've heard some say, dear Lord, that we give 10% because that's your word, but we know that the rest of the 90 is still yours. And so we ask, Father God, that you would help us to use uh, our lives, our resources, our monies, Father God, whatever it is, for your glory and for the uplifting of your kingdom. May you bless it only with the favor that we know you can give to us, dear Lord. And we pray, Father God, that as we give, we don't give grudgingly or of out of necessity or some kind of need, but we give with a cheerful heart. We ask this only in Jesus' name. Amen. And praise your name, O oh Lord. He's become a true warrior. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Day to the best dad in the world. Happy Father's Day to my wonderful father. Happy Father's Day. May God bless and keep you. Love you. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day and thank you, fathers, for being there for your family. Happy Father's Day to my dad, Uncle Lou, and Papa. Have a great Father's Day. See you. Happy Father's Day to Dad. Father's Day. Say to all of the fathers, have a blessed day. 
I would like to say Happy Father's Day to my grandfather, Solomon Ledoux. Happy Father's Day! I would like to say Happy Father's Day to the best dad in the world, Sean Jones. Happy Father's Day to the best stepdad and grandpa in the world. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. I hope you have an amazing day. I love you. Happy Father's Day! Love, love you Daddy. so much. Have a wonderful Father's Day. Bye. Bye. Hello. I want to wish my father a very happy Father's Day, Mr. John W. Bland. On behalf of me, my sister Fayetta Bland, my son as well as my aunts and uncles we have ver been very much instrumental in raising as well we wish you a very happy and sweet father's day we love you daddy happy father's day to the best dad and pop pop ever me, Jalen, and Parker couldn't have a better person. Hope you enjoy your day. What's up, Pop? Just want to let you know you're the best provider, teacher, coach, mentor, everything all in one. And I want to know you're the best father a son could ever ask for. Happy Father's Day to Wallace Wallace our grandfather. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Love you. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Love you. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Love you. Happy Father's Day to Papa, Opa, and Daddy. Yeah! Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Daddy, Papa, and Papa. We love you. Guess what? Let me take a little time out to say happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there and just stay on bend the knees. I woke up this morning, I got out of bed, I looked around y'all, here's what I said, thank the Lord for the blood you shed. You put a roof up over my head. Thank you, Lord, for another day. And all of these blessings you sent my way. I could have been dead, sleeping in my grave. But you told them to get back and behave. 
Another blessing. Ooh -wee. Ooh -wee. Another blessing. Well, I've got my leg and I can walk. I've got my tongue, y'all, and I can He never left me. He's been good to me. He's been good to me. He's been good to me. Oh, yes, he has. Well, I've got my strength, y'all. Ain't that a blessing? I've got my health, y'all. Ain't that a blessing? I'm glad to be among the living, y'all. Ain't that a blessing, y'all? Ain't that a blessing, y'all? Ooh, we. Another blessing. Ooh, we. Another blessing. Say, God been good. And he's been kind, such a friend to yours and mine. He won't let us down. No, no, no. He's always there in his own time. Say, woo we another blessing. Woo we another blessing. Woo we another blessing. Woo -wee. Another blessing. Woo -wee. Another blessing. What a mighty God we serve. God is such an awesome God, and we certainly want to uh, say to the eldest father amongst us, that's our own uh, Deacon Jackson, and I pray that he's uh, watching and he can see his photo uh, up on the screen just a little bit earlier. We are thankful to the Lord for all of our fathers, and uh, I want to uh, personally uh, join in with all that we've heard so far to let our fathers know that uh, we love you, uh, we're depending on you uh, to do just what you said. God has given us an awesome responsibility. I thank the Lord for all that uh, come together on Sunday mornings to ensure that we continue to uh, have these times of worship. Uh, continue to pray for us here as we uh, do our best. We strive to live stream uh, our worship uh, every Sunday uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, don't forget that uh, all that you get to enjoy, these deacons that come out on Saturday, uh, our chairman of deacons, Deacon Howard, has ensured that there is a uh, duty roster and they are here making sure that they can provide for the members of this congregation. And so uh, I, I'm simply calling out the fact that there are those who want to ensure that things continue to go well. Uh, we have our portions of our praise team, and I've watched them as they've come in Sunday after Sunday, our minister of music, our musicians that support uh, these wonderful singers. Uh, one day I'm going to be able to sing just like that, and I'm going to break out in a song for y'all. But today is not the day. <laughs> Listen, uh, at home and uh, wherever you're watching from, you understand that we have a, 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 an awesome responsibility. Every Sunday, I, I raise this Bible. And when I raise this Bible, I'm reminding us of the standard that we live by. It is the Word of God. 
And so this is my Bible. It does not merely contain the word of God. It is the word of God. And I believe God. I believe God is who he says he is. I believe God can do what he says he can do. I believe that I am who God says that I am. And I believe we can do what God says we can do. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And this word reminds us of who we are. We are not anybody. We are the children of God. And uh, this world has gone through a lot. And I think it's time again for us to be reminded of just who we are in Christ. Very simple passage of scripture today. Um, I'm going to read six verses uh, while focusing on, on one. But I'm going to read the six to lay out the background. Most of you who are familiar with Sunday school and our Bible study, those of you who are familiar with just simple Bible reading on your own will immediately recognize these verses. I want you to look at, uh, for this morning, this Father's Day morning, Matthew, the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 6 verses, focusing on verses 1, 2, and 6, but I'd like to read all six to give us context in the midst of our content. Matthew 5, beginning at the very first verse, very familiar passage. I'm reading from the King James Version. And here he simply says, and seeing the multitude, he saw the crowds. He went up into a mountain, and when he was set, the Bible says his disciples came to him. He took this opportunity, in other words. It was not a called meeting. It was not a time of scheduled worship. I hope you see that. Jesus took an opportunity. The Bible says he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But it was this sixth verse, and it's this verse I want to focus on today. He said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then he said, For they shall be filled. I want to stop right there. I want to speak to us. I want to encourage us. And I want to challenge us from this subject. Simply stated, God's people and God's righteousness. God's people and God's righteousness. Thank you so much, those of you who are here and labor along with me uh, as we make sure that our, the God's people continue to receive uh, their time of worship opportunity. Again, I want to say to all of our fathers, Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you here and those who are listening by live stream, uh, we have a, a good t contingent of folk uh, in California that uh, is listening in. Uh, normally this time of year, I'm in California. And because of COVID, uh, we are not, but we're not physically, but we're still there. And so happy Father's Day to you as well. Let me remind you as, as we get into this that the word father is not just a person. It doesn't identify just a person. The word father is also a position. It's a role. And as a father, I've thought a lot about our position and our role during these troubling times in which we live, especially the last several months. What does God expect of us during our life journey? Especially during times like this, what, what does God expect of us? Does, does God expect us to, to find our individual camps and, and challenge the position 
of other camps. What, what does God expect of us? Our family responsibility, when we talk about fathers, is usually what comes to mind. But our family responsibility is only a part, and it's a small part, of our overall life responsibility from God's perspective. All through the Bible, all through the Bible, men sat in the gate to deal with the trouble issues of their entire community. These were fathers from every home who were upright and they, they, their role was to make sure that God's standard was kept. I said it was men who sat in the gate. It was a big part of their role, their responsibility to ensure that God's standard was kept. Simply put, their role was to keep God's righteousness before God's people. And when issues sprang up, issues of divisiveness or issues of great concern, it was always the men in the gate. I wish I had a witness. That ensured that we had God's righteousness to deal with the issue of the day. This morning I want to talk about God's righteousness and what that means for God's people. We've experienced some troubling issues in our nation over the past few weeks. I'm, as a matter of fact, if you haven't heard about the troubling issues, you have to be living under a rock, and that rock has to have a rock on top of it. Come on. In reality, these are really old issues, which were never really fully addressed and now have given birth to horrendous consequences. Our nation has omitted these problems so long that our nation operates on misguided principles instead of godly principles that it claims. Right. These kind of issues in our society can only be fixed by the church. Godly men and women who know and understand God's truth. But sadly, the American church has become infected with a blind spot, which has caused some serious tears in the fabric of the soul of our nation. And that's on, that's on the church. The most important thing for any real Christians, white or black, rich or poor, male or female, is to know and understand the mind of God. Because how we as God's people should feel, think, and behave is all found in the mind of God. When godly values are left up to the fallen mind of fallen men, to interpret on their own wisdom, there will always be a blindness that results. Why? Because every human being thinks that their definition of right and wrong must be God's idea of right and wrong. That's why in every society, in every ethnic group, where there is a Christian contingent, a Christian population, the Lord's Supper picture always shows that ethnic group present at the table. Every human being thinks that their definition of right and wrong must be God's idea. And that is exactly what happened to Israel during the time of the judges. God's people developed blind spots because every man did what was right in his own eyes. All right, all right. In every chapter, when we look at the horrendous things uh, that had happened, uh, the Bible underscores that every man did what was right in his own eyes. Right. And whether you know it or not, this is the ungodly spirit that is reigning within our nation today. During Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he addressed a lot of different issues that God's people needed to face up to but none more serious than the one he revealed in Matthew 5 and 6. Right. Look at it again. Matthew 5 and verse 6. It says, blessed. He's in this sermon, this opportunity this sermon, this unscheduled sermon. The Bible says that the crowds came to him. And his disciples gathered themselves, and he began to teach them. Right. And one of the first of several lessons, the Bible says he calls out that they are blessed when you hunger and thirst after righteousness. The 
Greek word blessed simply means to be happy. But that is not what Jesus identified with here in his beatitude. Because Jesus' reference to the word blessed means more than just being happy about some situation or circumstance. Right. It's on your screen there. His idea of being blessed means having the favor of God. So how can we know how God feels about a thing? Right. Or how can we really understand what God thinks about some issues? We got some issues. What does God think? I've heard people say that we cannot know for sure how God thinks or what God would do in a certain situation because our minds are finite and while God is infinite. And while it is true that God is truly infinite, what an awesome God he is. And it is true we are mere finite mortals. I don't agree with those who say we cannot know the mind of God on these complex issues in life. But you see in John 14 and 9, listen to what Jesus told his disciple Philip when he said, how can we know? Verse 9, the Bible says, Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. How saith thou then, show us the Father? So what Jesus says to us about God and how Jesus lived his life and accomplished his works give us a perfect revelation of the mind of God, right. the Father. In other words, if you want to know what God thinks, how he feels, how he acts and works, what grieves him and what pleases him, all you have to do is study the word and observe the behavior of Jesus Christ. It is true, brothers and sisters, we are different from one another in a whole lot of ways. We don't all think the same. We have different fingerprints. We have different eyesight of clarity. Our hair fashions are different. Our skin color varies. We have different heritage, intelligence levels, and personalities, not to mention different height and weight. But we all are alike in that while we are here on earth, we do hunger and thirst. Everybody hunger and thirst. I said everybody hunger and thirst. And Jesus, in his usual manner of simplifying that which is complicated, used this common demonstration to express the truth of this fourth way to receiving God's favor. Read it again, Matthew 5 and 6. I, I just like putting it up there. He said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. In order for you to really understand, because I brought up this the racial uh, situation in our land today, but in order for you to really understand what touched off a nerve in our nation during the killing of George Floyd back uh, 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 a few weeks ago, you'd really have to know a lot more about what protective measures our government put in place during civil rights era in order to ensure control of the so-called colored population in America. And I will tell you that many of my brothers and sisters in the church in Christ who don't look like me had a big hand in this racial sin back in the 60s because our brothers and sisters had positions of authority in places of renown. And that is why 11 a.m. on Sunday is still the most segregated time in America to this day. But I need God's people, black and white, yellow and brown, that may be listening today to hear me this morning. Right. This is not a time for hate or thoughts of revenge, but a time for God's righteousness to reign. Come on. Because if we are to fix the ungodliness of racial injustice, 
which is spreading throughout our land, if we are to fix the problems of police brutality and ignorance, the most important thing is for the heads of our families to ensure that our wives and children hunger and thirst after righteousness. And while I do not have enough time to unpack all the historical background which brought us to this injustice of our day, I'll tell you just what Jesus was getting at when he preached his Sermon on the Mount about righteousness. And it has everything to do with what we must do now to help our nation get back on its feet. The other day, Jesus was actually asking a question to those who dared to follow him. Did I tell you that it wasn't a scheduled sermon? Did I tell you he was simply going to get away from the crowds? <laughs> Bible says when he saw the crowds, he went up into the mountains. The implication is that he was trying to get a, a little room for himself. I, I wish I had him. But the Bible says folks saw him. And they began to follow him. As the masses followed him, the disciples came and they sat when he sat. The Bible simply says he began to teach. When Jesus began to teach, he asked a question. And here's his question. How much do you really want righteousness? How much do you really want righteousness? You see, the Jews were clamoring for righteousness from the Romans. They were being uh, in, there was injustice across the land. I wish I had a witness. If, if you were not a Roman, you had no rights. And so the Jews demanded rights. Jesus wanted to know how much do you really want righteousness? Do you want it as much as a hungry person? wants food? Do you want it as much as a person who is starving in the middle of the desert wants food? Do you want it as much as a thirsty person wants water? Statistics tell us that in America more than 80% of its citizens claim to be Christian. All right. And since we are a nation based on majority rule, all problems that we have in America could be addressed by Christians. In Christian homes, fathers are responsible under God for creating the environment in which the family lives, enjoys, and shares this life. And if that is true, and it is, then on this Father's Day, it is imperative that fathers must be hungry and thirsty after righteousness. We got to want it for our friends and our enemies alike. Why? Jesus says that if you really hunger and thirst after righteousness, then God will fill you up on his righteousness. And he will favor your life with his righteousness. Why? Because to hunger and thirst after righteousness is the way to God's blessings in your life. Here are four reasons why they are the way to blessedness in your life. Reason number one, four A, because of the things that hunger and thirst imply in this life. Reason number two, because of the lessons that hunger and thirst teaches us in this life. You know when you're hungry and thirsty, you, you get taught some stuff. All right. Reason number three, because of the desires that hunger and thirst creates within us. Do you realize that if you force a man to, to steal to get food, then he will become a thief? I wish I had a witness. Come on, come on. Reason number four. Because of the satisfaction that being filled gives us. If you've ever enjoyed a good meal where you had to loosen your belt, Open the button, top button, just to breathe. You understand what I mean by satisfaction. Reason number one, because of the things hunger and thirst imply in this life. We use the words, we throw them around casually. 
But the very term hunger and thirst, these are words that imply some things to us. When somebody says they're hungry, they're implying to you that they need food. See, the word, that, what they, they didn't say, I need food, but when, when you say the word hunger, you automatically know they're in need. I, just what do the words hunger and thirst imply or suggest? In this sermon, however, Jesus took these negative words of agony and pain and he showed the bright side of hunger and thirst. He showed us that these words can suggest four positive things as it relates to number one, life. Because hunger and thirst relate something with respect to life. But not only that, it relates to our health. It relates to our ability to grow. And finally, it talks to us about the enjoyment of life because we can hunger and thirst and be filled. Anytime you deny a person these things, then you do not desire God's righteousness. That's why so many Christian groups spend time feeding folk. I wish. Come on. Peter said it this way because the Bible uses these things to help us understand greater things. Here's what Peter said, 1 Peter 2 and 2. He says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby or by it. So he tells us that it is important in life just like a baby getting nourishment. Hunger and thirst has something to imply to us about life itself. As soon as all babies enter this world they hunger. You can put your finger to their lips. They haven't had a class. They haven't seen a video. They haven't tuned into YouTube. They have none of that. But that baby starts sucking because that baby knows that hunger yeah, is a part of life. I wish I had it. They hunger and thirst for one reason. For one reason only. Not because they've been taught it. Not because it's intuitive. But one reason. And that one reason is that they are alive. They are alive. And as soon as you are born into God's kingdom, you begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Just the way a baby hungers and thirsts for food. Peter said it this way, as a newborn babe desires the sincere milk of the word that you may grow over there by. When a believer does not hunger or thirst for righteousness, then that believer is not really a believer because that person has no life in them. But where there is hunger, there is an inner yearning for more. You can know that. You have the life that Christ came to give. And this life always brings God's favor and blessing. What about health? Well, a Christian who insists on attending church every week, who looks forward to Bible study, and who always offers a helping hand to those in need, has good spiritual health. A Christian who loves to worship with fellow believers has great spiritual health, who has an appetite for Bible reading and study and who just can't get enough of God will always receive a good report from the great physician on his or her spiritual health or spiritual checkup. Those who are spiritually healthy, the Bible then says, are blessed. What about growth? Because you can eat all day, but you may not grow or, or do it. Well, to hunger and thirst for righteousness means to eat well also spiritually. When we regularly feast on nourishment from God, we grow. We mature. And as we grow, we hunger and thirst for the deeper or more media things of God. No longer are we satisfied for the snack. We're looking for the media part of God's word. The church at Corinth experienced delayed spiritual growth because they remained satisfied with the milk of God's word and developed no appetite for the meat of his word. Look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 and 2 says it like this, and I brethren he said I wanted to teach you something. He said but I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. He said I, could, I just couldn't I couldn't talk to you. 
like you were grown up. He said, but as unto carnal, that, that's the worldly. He said, I had, to, I had to give you a little bit, even as unto babes in Christ. Look at verse 2. He says, I have fed you. That's a pastor. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. You see, a newborn baby, you can't fix that baby a steak. I don't care how you parade and all of that. Baby's system can't take steak. A baby's body is designed to break down and deal with milk. And Paul says that the Christians in the church at Corinth had not progressed. They had not grown. And therefore, they couldn't move on to more solid food from the word of God. Right. What about enjoyment? When, when we talk about being filled, that's a piece of this enjoyment. You see, because a healthy appetite, and I know when you look at me, you know I have a healthy appetite. I'm glad I have 6-1 to spread it across. Amen, because I have a healthy appetite. And a healthy appetite is essential to enjoying a meal. One of the first signs of sickness is a loss of appetite. I wish I, and those who hunger for righteousness enjoy feasting on God's word. They enjoy Christian worship, prayer, and fellowship. There are some of you hunger for it right now. We've been away from each other. You're hungering for fellowship and worship one with another. As they satisfy their appetite, they will experience happiness. Brothers and sisters, the roots of racism, hate, envy, jealousy, and strife are deep wounds in the fabric of our nation. And it's because we as a nation have a healthy appetite for everything but God's righteousness. We have an appetite for politics. We, have, we will hate each other over political differences and never consider the fact that God's word says, I am my brother's keeper. All right. Money. We have an appetite for money. We'd rather make money, even if it means that others will have to die. Come on. You'll get that when you get home from the store, from the restaurant, from your job. We, 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 we have an appetite for career. So what if your kids can't read? We are a nation that will sacrifice our children at the price of making a name for ourselves. We have an appetite for immoral sex. We will sleep around and then try to legitimize it by calling it common law. I'm talking about our nation. We have an appetite for lying and stealing. Well, it's all right as long as we win our argument. Really? <laughs> I wonder what God thinks about that. Come on. Yes, we have a ravenous and healthy appetite for everything but God's righteousness. Listen to what God told Solomon about how to get your nation back on track. When it's off the rails, you have to get your appetite right. You have to get, get those things in place. You have to get on the table what's supposed to be on the table. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, notice he didn't say if the world gets straight. He says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall eat a little humbleness. He said, humble themselves. And then put a dash of prayer. He said, pray. And don't forget we have to seek his face. But you got to put some stuff off your plate too. He says, turn from their wicked ways. He said, that will be some results. He said, then will I hear from heaven. He will forgive our sins. And the Bible says he will heal the land. Now, I don't know if you know what heal means, but heal means the, the sore and the wounds that were present all, right. all gone. He went on, 
drop down to uh, verse 19 because there's some warning. He talked about how to get it right. But he says some things about if we don't get it right. He says in verse 19 through 22, he says, But if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, in other words, to do other than what God has said, he said, Then will I pluck them up by the root out of my land, which I have given them in this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. And this house, God is talking about his house, which is high, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by it, so that he shall say, why hath the Lord done this unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, of their fathers, right. of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods, worshipped them and served them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. In other words, we better get our righteousness back. We need to get that straight. We have to make sure that if we want to make this thing happen, we've got to pursue hunger and thirsting and what it implies. Here's reason number two. Because of the lessons hunger and thirst teaches us in this life. Being hungry and thirsty, you learn some lessons. When you don't have food, when you don't have the necessary needs, you learn some stuff. When you're in the desert, I read a, uh, an article some uh, months ago about some folk that went hiking. They were in the New Mexico desert, and they went hiking and got lost in the desert. And uh, they had to call out all kind of uh, agencies to find uh, these experienced hikers uh, they got hungry and thirsty and as they were carting one old boy off he said I learned a lot you see when you're hungry and thirsty you can learn a number of things that you might never otherwise learn you see if you're lost in the desert you might, might learn to retrieve water from a cactus plant or find wild berries and you would have never needed to learn that stuff. But like, likewise, hunger and thirst for righteousness can teach us a lot of lessons. And here's a few. The one thing that hungering and thirsting for righteousness can teach us is that things cannot fully satisfy the soul of a man. Things cannot fully satisfy the soul of a man. Matthew 4 and 4 says this. And he asked and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. All right. Has anybody read this Bible? Come on, come on. Man shall not live by bread alone. In other words, that's not, food is not all we hunger for. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That was a story of an old king we used to uh, talk about when I was younger. His name was called King Midas. King Midas uh, had such a hunger for gold that he wished all that he touched would turn to gold. He wished everything that he touched, that he put his hands to, would turn to gold. And one day, he kept bothering, bothering, and kept saying he wished and wished and wished and wished, and that's all he would do. And so one day God granted his wish. So that he, everything he touched turned to gold, his furniture. He'd go to bed, his bed, his dinnerware, his clothing, everything. It was all so wonderful until his little girl came running home. And when he reached out to touch her, she also turned to gold. It was then that King Midas realized that things alone cannot fully satisfy 
Jesus said it this way in Luke 12 and 15. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. In other words, things are not all we need to become satisfied. Here's the next lesson that's closely akin to this. God alone meets our total needs. You'll learn some things if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. God alone meets all of our total needs. Psalm 42, 1 and 2 says something to, of this here. Uh, the psalmist right. he says, As the, the deer, the heart, the deer panteth after water. As a deer longs and looks for water, the water brook, so panteth my soul. So I, I, I'm longing. My soul longs after thee, O God. Look at verse 2. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? He said, I can't wait. I can't wait because I long for, I hunger and I thirst for God and the things of God. God has placed an insatiable hunger and thirst for him inside of us. In John 14 and 8, when Jesus told his disciples that I and the Father are one, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Philip was saying, I'm hungry and thirsty for God's righteousness because only God alone can meet our needs. And that's important. We learn. We learn when we're hungry and thirsty. We'll learn. It, it teaches us some things. Here's number three, reason number three. Because of the desires that hunger and thirst creates within us. When you're hungry and you're thirsty, there are some things that become created in you. When you hunger and thirst for something, that means you want it bad. Yeah, you, you want it bad. It starts out that it's just a want, a need. Then after a while, it becomes a great desire. Just what is, and this is the right time to ask, what is this righteousness that we keep talking about hungering and thirsting for? This righteousness that Jesus says we ought to hunger and thirst for. Because up to now, you might have thought that it was only about justice or us treating each other right. But what is this righteousness? It's more than judicial justice or a rigid code of conduct because that's not going to fix our nation. All right. When I want righteousness, I want more than you just to be nice to me. I want more than just a fair trial All right. from men on earth. To hunger and thirst after righteousness means nothing less than to desire the goodness of a good God. And, and, and as a Christian, others ought to expect God's goodness from me. Righteousness creates three things in a person when we desire it. I said righteousness creates three things. There it is on the screen. In a person when we desire it. Number one, righteousness creates the desire to do what is good. Yeah. When I'm hungry for righteousness, righteousness creates in me the desire to do good. Romans 7, 16 through 18, uh, uh, Paul was writing, he says, if then I do that which I would not, he says, I, I do some things that I, I normally wouldn't do. He says, I consent unto the law that it is good. He said, in other words, if I'm just obeying the law, it, it's good, but I, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't for the law. You know, like that stop sign. Come on. That I, yeah, that, that's the only reason some of us stop, because there's a sign there. Come on. He said, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwell in me. In other words, it's sin that's causing me to, to not want to do the things that are right. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 simply says, 
For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. In other words, the goodness that we have to have has to come from somewhere else. Because I wasn't born with it. I can't take a class and get it. No matter how holy I am, I ain't got it. Where does it come from? It's God's righteousness. Paul realized that he was not all he wanted to be. But if we desire personal goodness, our Heavenly Father will give us power to do what is right. When the desire for personal goodness saturates us, God's favor becomes a reality in our life. And when you begin to share the goodness of God, there, there's a joy, an unspeakable joy that begins to emanate in the soul of a person. Paul realized that he wasn't all that he needed to be, all that he wanted to be, and he didn't have it in him. He remembered when he was a scoundrel. When the desire for personal goodness saturates us, God's favor becomes a reality. Here's the second thing that righteousness creates. Righteousness creates the desire to do good to others. It's not just uh, to, to be good, but righteousness desire creates desire in me to do good for others All right. several weeks ago we had our brotherhood out here and they were passing out food that had been donated and we thank the Lord for those men and women those agencies uh, through the UBA that made the food possible and there are other entities that are giving food but those who are receiving the food, there are folk on this end making sure you get it. You want to do good. What does the Lord require of us? Micah 6 and 8 says to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. We have a sincere desire to do good to others. We become generous in our remarks about and to other people. In other words, we, we don't tear people down. We build them up. Right. We go the second mile just to help other folk. Soon we begin to question our motives. As a matter of fact, if you really desire and right righteousness that puts this desire in you to do good to others, after a while you'll start doing good for others and you'll look around and you'll start questioning your motive for even doing it. Am I doing this for me or am I, am I really doing this because God wants me? I wish I had a witness. Come on, come on. We begin to question our motives because we want to be right with God right. and with man. Here's number three. I have to move on. Righteousness creates the desire to know more about God. I want to know my God. I don't just want to read the Bible. I want to know my God. You see, reading my Bible is milk. Whether most people know it or not, that, that, that's just milk. But I want to know. I want to know my God. The Bible tells us from the mouth of Jesus that God alone is truly good. When Jesus was questioned, he said, why do you call me good? Y'all remember that? He said, no one is good except God alone. You see, the desire to know God edifies and instills happiness within us. You just can't be a mean, honorary person and desire to know God better. No one is happier or is more favored by God than those who hunger and thirst to know God more. All right. And so we satisfy that hunger daily by reading God's word and praying and serving and ministering under his authority. And so on this Father's Day, I want to be a good man. I want to be a good godly man. I want to be a good person. I want to be a good husband, a good pastor, a good father, a good son, a good friend, and a good neighbor. Because I just desire to be good. Why? Because I hunger 
and thirst after righteousness and righteousness creates a desire to be good just like the God we serve All right. here's reason number four and then I'll leave you alone reason number four because of the satisfaction that being filled gives us look at Matthew 5 and 6 one more time blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness colon for they shall that word shall is not there by happenstance that word shall means you can put it in the bank Come on. it's an exclamation it's an imperative for they shall be filled Jesus promised that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled that phrase simply means they will be satisfied he says that he's going to let you eat from the buffet table until you are full full of what? righteousness righteousness but what satisfaction does this hunger and thirst bring us? Since we understand about being satisfied with food, what satisfaction does being filled with this righteousness bring us? Well, there are two satisfactions that the Bible assures us by the promises of God. The first is the satisfaction of experiencing the goodness of this life. God says he will bless you right now. He'll bless. I, I, I can't promise you like some fellas. I've seen these fellas on TV. They tell you that you can have a million dollars. All you have to do is stay home. and You just ask God for it and claim it and claim it. And a, and a check will show up in your mail. But I, I, can't, I, I can't promise you that. But what I can tell you is what God said. You will experience the goodness of this life. And Jesus revealed this truth in a familiar passage. Psalm 23, 1 and 2. Here's how he said it. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm talking about being satisfied. And look at what he said. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He says he's he going to allow me to rest. He leadeth me beside the still waters. There's no trouble. I, 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 I don't have a bunch of drama going on in my life. Has anybody read this Bible? He, he, he says he making me to lie down. He leading me beside the quiet water. Look at Psalm 23, 5 and 6. Amen. Because that helps me in where I'm going. He says, thou prepares the table before me. I'm talking about hunger and thirst now. Right. Thou prepares the table before me. Well, Lord, in the presence of my enemies. He said, People can hate you all day long, but the Lord will feed you right in front. I wish I had a witness. Thou anointest my head with oil. When you went into a person's house in that day, amen, uh, uh, they would anoint you. They would clean you up. They'd, they'd wash your feet. I wish I had a witness. They'd wash your feet, and then they'd oil you up. Anointest my head with oil. And then they, they'd help show you that you were real welcome. they 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 Pour your drink in your cup, and your cup, but not just a little bit. They didn't just fill it up halfway. The Bible says, my cup runneth over. That sixth verse says, surely, don't miss this, surely goodness, there it is, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Whose goodness? God's goodness. Where does it come from? His righteousness. Follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell. I'm going to live in the house of the Lord forever. He prepares this for me. And then when this life is over, there's a second satisfaction. It's the satisfaction of entering into complete goodness in the life to come. Those who hunger will eat. Those who thirst will drink. Both will be satisfied. Jesus promised, and his promises are without question. Right. So let me close like this. You've got a hunger and thirst for more than this world can offer. That's right. Because this world is not our home. 
And Jesus said in John 7, 37 and 38, Here's what he said. In the last days, that great day of the feast, they're talking about the feast days, and Jesus went on earth. He he gone to them, and it was the last day. The Bible says that Jesus stood up and he he shouted out, he cried, said, If any man thirst. Right. Have y'all read this Bible? He says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Yeah. Look at 38. He that believeth on me. Thirty-eight. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living living water. So, what what is all that about? Jesus said, not only will he provide water so that you can drink, he's gonna make you a part of his provision. He's gonna make you part of the fountain, so other folk can come to you, and get what he's given through you. I wish I had a witness. If you're hungry and thirsty this morning, I dare you to try Jesus. There's always room for you at the banquet table of Jesus. When I was growing up, my grandmother could really lay out a spread. She could really cook. She could cook. She cooked things that made me hungry just thinking about it. The smell that came from my grandmother's kitchen. The way she took a little bit of nothing and made mouth-watering meals, biscuits so light and fluffy. I got a flashback, cakes that make you drool. Her table was set for kings and queens, even though we barely had shoes on our feet, even when we knew we really didn't have it like that. And she'd give me a taste before the whole meal was ready. Every now and then, you know what they call that, don't you? They call that favor <laughs> when they give you a little taste before you get the whole meal. And that's what I've been trying to tell you, that while we're here, he's willing to give us a taste of what's to come. His goodness and his mercy follows me all the days of my life. And the more grandma cooked, the hungrier I got. Brothers and sisters, the other day Jesus set a table. And he invited us all to his table. Black and white, rich and poor, male and female, educated and uneducated. But you got to be hungry and thirsty to sit at his table. You got to be hungry. For the righteousness of God. Righteousness cares about everybody in the family. Righteousness means I live right no matter what. Righteousness means I care right no matter what. Righteousness loves right no matter what. Righteousness tells the truth no matter what. Righteousness invites everybody to the table because at his table everybody gets to eat that's why he came down through 42 generations 42 generations to bring righteousness righteousness is what brought Jesus down those generations righteousness arrested him in the garden of Gethsemane it was righteousness that whipped him Jesus all night long from the sixth to the ninth hour, it was righteousness that kept Jesus on that cross, that old rugged cross. It was because of righteousness that he bowed his head into the lock of his shoulders and he died. Righteousness kept him in the grave for three days. But early Sunday morning, it was also righteousness that raised him up. All power in heaven and earth in his hand I stop by to tell you that if you're not hungry you're not hungry and thirsty for you some Jesus you need to get a checkup having been out from worship of all of God's people if, if you're not hungry yet for you some Jesus is something wrong with you hunger and thirst when we all get to heaven when we all get
get to heaven when we all get to heaven what a time that's what the author is saying what a time what a time what a time brothers and sisters now is not the time to lose our head now is not the time to demand the things that we were supposed to have had enacted 50 years ago we have men and women standing on the wall to ensure those things are in place. But we have too many God-fearing men and women, black and white, yellow and brown, in places of authority that won't speak and tell God what we want. What do we want? We want to be filled with his righteousness. His righteousness. His righteousness. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Glory to Almighty God. God's people and God's righteousness. My brothers and sisters, it's invitation time right where you are right where you are in your home rather your living room your study maybe you were eating and listening maybe you were tired this morning and you laid in bed but you tuned in live stream to hear the word of God invitation right now at this time we would like for you to call in with your prayer requests have you call in with your concerns but it's decision time right now have you made a decision for Christ Pastor Hall through the power of the Holy Spirit the vessel that he is at this church has preached a dynamic message in a time like these. Will you accept Christ today? What are you hungry and thirsting for right now? Maybe it's a new job. You're, you're getting unemployment and maybe stimulus money and you know that's going to run out and you know you need a job. Maybe you need your health to be increased. Whatever the case, Jesus is the key to that. And that can happen for you instantly. We're going to say a prayer. The doors of the church, the doors of your heart can be opened right now. Jesus is knocking. And you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've messed up, I've made mistakes, bad choices. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that God raised you, Jesus, three days after being put in a borrowed tomb. And on that third day, you rose with all authority, all power in heaven and earth in your hands. What are you thirsty and hungry for? God's righteousness, if you say it, that prayer, Jesus can come into your life and make a difference. Maybe you've been a Christian a long time and you've been sitting down on God and you want to start a new, start afresh. As you know, churches are not open, not, not, not the buildings. But God can prepare you for a work that when this thing is all over and God has done what he needed to do in the midst of this, you come in running for God. A new person, a new mind, the mind of God, the mind of Christ. Jesus is calling. Answer that call. You won't, you won't be sorry. He's that kind of God. He's a right now God. He will forgive you and start you afresh. I'm a witness, and you're a witness. Let God do what God can do. God bless you. God keep you.
is our prayer. seeking that righteousness in this time and this period we're living in God is such a mighty good God do you know him oh do you want to feel that righteousness of the Lord in order to feel that righteousness you must be like him in order to be like him you must accept him as your Lord and Savior God is such a powerful God I'm a reminder of one of our mentors as in glory now, Pastor Neil, he used to use this statement all the time. He said, get right, church, and let's go home. And my plea to you today, get right with God. And all you have to do is fall out with your sinful ways and say, I'm lost and I need a Savior. And that's what it's all about. You know, over 42 generations 2,000 years ago, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. And I am so thankful Pastor had uh, given this opportunity each Sunday that we can share the Lord's Supper with you. I'm going to use the old country board term that I like to throw out there every once in a while. Ain't God good? He's been good to me, and as I do this live stream and, and as I talk to you, 
He's been good to you too. But that upper room and that last meal, oh, I want you to just think for a moment. Just, this is not a ritual. This is not something that you just, well, let's take the Lord's Supper. No, I want you to think for a moment. I want you to begin to pray. I want you to begin to say, imagine, if you will, you're in that upper room with the Lord. You're in that room, that, that last supper, and, and he dropped a bomb on him. They had no idea that that was going to be the last supper that he would spend with them on this earth. And he shared with them about he's going to be betrayed, and, and he shared with them, and, and they couldn't understand what was being said to him. And, and so much so when he said, somebody's going to betray me, uh, they began to ask them the question with themselves. Is it I? And Jesus, the youngest, and, and I, 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 I have to continue to share how Pastor do it. He says, the youngest one couldn't have been no more than 17, 18, 16 to 18 years old. John, Peter nudged him and said, who do you think it is? Now that's my perception. But then John leaned on Jesus breast there and began to ask him the question and he said he that dippest with me first will be the one to betray me and then he looked in that traitor's eye and said do what you must do and do it quickly scripture tells us when Judas left the table and left the scene then it was night then that's when that last supper was instituted where me and you will continue on until he returns. I'm ready for him to return. I'm happy. I'm telling you, I'm happy because he talked about righteousness today. And how can I have that righteousness in this and that Christ Jesus? Are you craving for it? All right. But on that last supper, that last afternoon, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, and we're going to do that right now. If you will, let us prepare for that supper. Our God is he's still on the throne and he is worthy to be praised and we're going to praise him today. We're going to serve him because he's an everlasting God. And at that time, those two ordinances that he said in order, and he said, I want you to continue to do this until I return. And one of those were the Lord's Supper, and we know the baptism. But before he distributed to the disciples, they prayed. I'm going to ask Deacon Blunt to pray for the bread that represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this bread that represents your body. We thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And likewise, they prayed over the vine, the blood, which represents. Deacon Andrews will pray over the blood. Our Father in heaven, we come now to thank you for this day. We thank you for another chance to remember. Now we ask that thou would bless the cup. For it represents the spilled blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it is his name that we ask it. And for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. And then the ordinance of the Last Supper was introduced. This is my body. Yeah, this is this is my body and this is my blood. This is my body. It represents the blood of Jesus Christ. This is my blood. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Amen. As we prepare... I'm always reminded 
in the scripture when Paul had to address the Corinthians about this. And chills go over my body because Paul said, let a man examine himself. So do some self-examination. This is not a ritual. We don't do this just to be doing something. This is the body of Christ. So let us take it and eat it all. And likewise, the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, let us drink it all. Once again, our God is an awesome God. And he is worthy to be praised. What a, what a beautiful Sunday. Uh, my shout out to all the fathers. God is a great God. There's no way we can say that we've been perfect, but we serve a perfect God. And when you thirst after that righteousness, and I have a saying, every day is a brand new day. And you can start that new day off serving our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for uh, the live streaming, you viewing in with us. And, and as we dismiss, we want to continue to pray for our sick and our shit in. Those that are uh, having procedures this week, uh, we pray you up, and may God bless you and keep you. So let us pray. Father God, we just thank you once again for a powerful message from our pastor that glorifies Jesus and him alone. God, as we thirst after that righteousness, oh God, we pray for our nation that's truly in a turmoil. Well, Lord, I'm reminded of your word. If we just come, turn from our ways and turn back to you, Lord, the the burden is really on the church. And what I mean by that in this prayer, Father God, we need to seek the answers from you. Lord, we pray and we thank you and we praise you and we will continue to serve you until you return. In the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior rest, rule, and abide in each and every one of us, henceforth and forevermore. Let us all respond. Amen, and thank God. May God bless you and keep you is our prayer. Well, hallelujah. Bethany, what a wonderful live stream opportunity for worship. We thank the Lord for this once again. We want to remind you with all the love that we can that we're still uh, very concerned about the situation. Be mindful that uh, you st keep masks, uh, keep washing those hands, be safe, remember to stay uh, distant, uh, just so that everybody will be safe. Just like we're safe in the Lord eternally, we want to be safe while we live here. So thank you for being with us. Thank you for being faithful once again. If you know of someone who has not been able to uh, enjoy the live stream. Let them know what's going on. All they need to do is go to www.bethany1925.com and click on the live stream link. We love you. May the Lord bless you. Remember, all things work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We'll see you next Sunday.